Good afternoon, LAS members and attendees of the annual meeting. Thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome to this afternoon's keynote address. I'm very pleased to be uh, joined here today with a distinguished panel that will be addressing and discussing lessons in licensing from the NFL Players Association and comparisons with technology licensing. So I am Brian O'Shaughnessy. I am a past president of the Licensing Executive Society, USA and Canada and I currently serve as the Senior VP for Public Policy. I'm joined here with a number of distinguished panelists, including two representatives from the NFL Players Association with a long and storied history with NFLPA, and I will let them introduce themselves, and then I'll let our other two panelists introduce themselves. So Dee, why don't we start with you? Sure. My name is Jamar Smith. I'm the Executive Director of the NFL Players Association, also serve as the CEO of our wholly owned subsidiary called Players Inc., which is our um, for-profit marketing and licensing company. Hi, I'm Eric Winston, uh, formerly uh, NFLPA president and now chief partnerships officer at One Team Partners. Dale? Hi, I'm Dale Davis. I'm the chief of patent counsel for Cummins Worldwide. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dale Sabatini. I'm the director of writing policy for uh, Ericsson. Uh, I am also the uh, senior VP for standards at Elite. All right. Well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started with the conversation. I've asked uh, Dee and Eric to kick things off. Tell us a little bit about the NFLPA and what they, what they do in terms of licensing of intangible property, most notably in the form of name, image, and likeness. So, sure. Dee, Why don't I start? And I'll let uh, Eric jump in. We've got a rich history in, uh, in the business of licensing and marketing. Um, for some of you, you will remember a name uh, of a former union leader named Marvin Miller, who used to head the MLB Players Association. About 40 years ago, Marvin came up with the idea of one way that the union could make money was to take the faces of baseball players and actually put them on the inside of Coca-Cola bottling caps. And from that day forward, that was the beginning of um, our sports unions getting into the business of licensing and marketing. So 40 years later, um, you're, you're here in the offices of the NFL uh, PA. You're in a building that we own. Um, downstairs is a company that generates approximately 200 to $240 million a, uh, a year in licensing and marketing revenue. And I'll just for the next few minutes just talk about what it means for that, you know, for that for a union. Um, we're one of the few unions in the world that's fully self-sustaining, which means we take a portion of that revenue that we generate from licensing and, and marketing. We pay every salary uh, in the union, every salary in, um, in Players Inc. And then we actually kick a $20,000 check back to every player in the National Football League. So why is that important from a union standpoint? Um, I'll let Eric talk about why that's important in the business of marketing and licensing. But from a union standpoint, um, we look at our wholly owned subsidiary as the engine that drives the train. Um, we are in a um, forced relationship <laughs> with the National Football League. And I'll just you know start off by saying that Roger Goodell is a personal and close friend of all of ours. Um, but we have a relationship where at times it's somewhat contested. Uh, we're a labor union that's committed to representing the rights um, and interest of our players. And at times, those labor battles 
mean either strikes or lockouts or litigation um, or other things that we have to engage in to, to protect the interest of our players. Being a union that can rely on an engine that generates revenue off of the licensing and marketing of partners um, of our members isn't just a money-making enterprise. For us, we view that our relationship um, with our licensing department as somewhat existential. So, you know, with that, um, I'm proud of our 30-year our uh, heritage of generating um, revenue from the licensing and marketing of our players. We, we love that business. Uh, we certainly love what it does uh, for our unions. But from that story about Marvin Miller, we, we evolved to a thing called the Madden game, which is um, our video game to ownership interest um, in, in licensing apparel, ownership interest in, um, in things like uh, bands that measure your heart rate and your biometrics. But one of the things I'm most proud of um, um, is how we now have evolved into a business that not only looks at NFL players, but looks at the relationship um, that we have with other unions. And, and before Eric talks, I, I, I take almost every opportunity to brag on him a little bit. Um, Eric was um, uh, the first player in our union to be elected president generally from the floor. Um, he served with distinction um, as our president for six years, most notably um, helping us negotiate the, the 2020 collective bargaining agreement that, um, that again, is going to set the standard in professional sports for the next 10 years. Um, he's now moved on to... Uh, I guess I could say bigger and better things, but I'm not sure there's anything bigger or more important than being the president of our union. Uh, but now he serves in a different. role. It's different. different. It's different. Um, so with that, uh, my good friend and um, uh, one of the best presidents we've ever had. Eric Thanks, Steve. And uh, Brian, thank you for getting us together and sharing with you guys. And, and really looking forward to the conversation here. Uh, I think, you know, I'll, I'll kind of pick up a little bit where Dee left off and. Uh, and saying, obviously, these unions and, and, and not just the NFLPA, but the MLBPA and, and some of the other ones, obviously, the NFLPA, really, if you look back through their for-profit licensing arm at NFL Players, Inc., have been leaders for a long time uh, in that, in, in licensing the group likeness of players to video game companies, trading card companies, apparel companies, and hardline companies. So if you've ever seen the fat head, you've seen the bobbleheads, all of that is intellectual property that has to be licensed, right? So we're really thinking about licensing in general and, and thinking about it from a broad lens. Uh, and as I'm sure our other panelists will, will discuss too, intellectual property is intellectual property, and there are a lot of tie-ins here. And, and so the, while the sports licensing and the, the applications of it uh, might have uh, some specialization to it, uh, there is some, I think, some broad themes here, and I'm sure that will be touched on by all the panels. Uh, about two years ago or so, um, I think the NFLPA and MLBPA uh, took a, a bold and, and I think very insightful step in saying what's next, right? We, we had a licensing arm that did a lot for a lot of years, and the next step was, okay, how can we now move into the future? How can we make this a 2.0, and, and how can we, uh, you know, whether you want to say more gasoline on the fire or whatever your cliche slash metaphor will be for that, how do we make this bigger, right? And, and then, um, you know, I'll, I'll spare everybody the details, but in steps, you know, one team partners, which is really a joint venture between the MLBPA, the, ML, the NFLPA, and a capital partner uh, to do just that, is to really invest in the business and to do some of the things that the unions not necessarily weren't positioned to do, but that could be done at a much bigger scale when you actually aggregated a lot of rights doing it around. It. Obviously, speaking to EA is speaking to EA, whether you're talking about a soccer game, uh, a football game, or a baseball game. And so we were able to aggregate some of those things, go out and hire real experts in those fields uh, to make it bigger, right? So when we think about one team partners, I really think about it in about four verticals. One is our core competency, it's our licensing, right? And everything's really kind of built around how do we grow that? How do we make it bigger? How do we do things on a much bigger scale? We're able to go out and hire uh, folks in the, in the industry like Henry Lowenfels from Scopely to really focus on our game section 
and not just focus on the NFL PA's game section, but but focus on all of our new partners, right? So as as you, as Ari Smith said, in our joint venture, we started off with the NFL PA, the MLB PA, but we quickly moved and we partnered with the MLS PA, the U.S. Women's National Team Soccer, and the W the WNBPA, along with U.S. Men's and Women's Rugby, and obviously, hopefully, adding more and more to the family in the future. And, and from that, from that expertise, we've been able to really go into whether it's the mobile gaming market, the NFT market that has exploded, and do different and very interesting things, and be able to, to parse those out and license the likeness of the players from several different sports in, in a lot of ways that really maximizes value for them and for our unions uh, that, that we serve and that, that we're partnering with. So when you think about video games, trading cards, apparel, everything that we're doing in those spaces for different partners, that's really what we have our eye on. That's how we're, we're thinking of it. But we're really going to these brands with a much well-rounded and a, and a much more robust offering, right? And, and so when you think about our other verticals, athlete marketing, sponsorship, and the athlete relations vertical, we want to bring athletes closer with these brands. We want to provide more opportunity, right? When we're thinking about licensing, we're thinking about these passive rights, but we really want to be able to activate those rights, and we want to be able to offer the brands a very turnkey experience when they go do that, right? And that, that goes into the athlete marketing, the sponsorship section, then we have a content section um, that, that while we do a lot of unbranded or, or what you say, non-scripted content, whether it's the Gronkowski show on YouTube or other things, a lot of it centers around the branded content. Again, marketing on our relationships with our sponsors and our licensing. Again, going to them and saying, hey, listen, not only can we do this deal for passive rights, but we can also do this deal to produce content to make sure you're getting it to the people that you wanted to get to. And we can really bring athletes in here and show them in a, in a, in a way that they care about, but also in a way that you care about and, and make this a holistic experience for everybody uh, and increase the value at the end of the day, that's what this is about, increase the value. Of I'd say our fourth vertical is in investing, right? We have a, a venture arm and a bit of an M&A arm uh, and, and, and overall just bringing expertise and being able to do different licensing. So obviously, when most folks have done licensing deals, at least in the sports space, it's a very simple minimum guarantee, a royalty on sales, and then, you know, hopefully our check comes and hopefully gets bigger um, every year. We've kind of taken the approach of, that's great, we want those student guarantees, but we're not going to just let you grow your business on the backs of the players without some terminal value at the end. So we've been able to do deals now because of the structure we've built where we're actually able to take some equity in companies um, uh, as, as value, whether it's in love royalties, or actually just because we're bringing so much value to the party that we believe and we've been able to go out and forcefully re uh, reaffirm that, listen, through these athletes, your, your company value is going to become so much better and so much bigger. And, and over the last two years, we've, uh, we've really proved that theory correct with a lot of uh, really transformative deals and, and again, largely led by the NFLPA. So, Brian, that's a little bit about what we're doing at one team. That's how we're thinking of it. But it, we, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about our partners. It's about the rights that they bring. It's about partnering with them and keeping the way that they're trying to value. It's a great, really innovative approach to licensing. So, Eric, one of the things uh, you mentioned earlier was uh, the fact that, you know, you're sort of licensing is a collective for large groups, but then individuals can go on and negotiate their own deals. Is that right? Yeah, so when we think about these licensing deals, and we really go back to the core, right? And, and we have a few lawyers up here that I'm sure we'll, we'll get to some of that, but as everyone knows, I, you know, if, if you don't have the rights, right, if you don't have those locked down, then, you know, it's hard to really maximize value. It's hard to drive any value because your counterparty and the brands are gonna are gonna want this, right? They're gonna want the, the safeguarding of that. And so again, the, the, the PAs serve as those aggregator of rights. And and how we think about group rights uh, usually is a threshold, right? And it's passive rights that we're talking about. And the NFL PAs uh, stands, you know, six or more in any commercial activity revolves around the group, right? Meaning that they have to come and get approval from the group 
to use those items, whether you're in sponsorship, whether you're licensing, kind of start parsing those out. They're, they're kind of becoming one and the same in a lot of ways. But that's the value that can be driven because, again, the PAs are going out educating the players. Um, they've been doing it and they've been showing those checks. I mean, and, and again, I think it's really important. The athletes are receiving checks from these deals for not doing it, right? Just using the likeness, it creates that incremental value, but it also creates additional uh, opportunities for the activation side, right? And so not only could uh, name your favorite quarterback, uh, well, not only will he get his check in the mail every year from the EA game, the Panini trading card deal, Fanatics, et cetera, down the line, but he'll also have opportunities to activate that license, right? So it'll also have uh, opportunities to make additional money in uh, whether it's TV shows or not TV shows, excuse me, TV commercials, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as you as they're really trying to prove that out. Now, what's not in it, and I think part of what you're getting to is the individual side, right? Those individuals can still go do uh, their direct TV deal and go do a commercial there. We're really talking about activations and we're talking about um, entities, brands that want large scale uh, number of players, right? And that's where the, the demarcation ends up living. And that's how we parse it out. Um, and, and obviously, really, the NFLPA has the enforcer and owner of those rights and parses those out. Wow. So, D, um, the difference that strikes me right off the bat is uh, you know, your licensing technology, it's a cold object that sits on a desk. Right. You're dealing with people who are living, breathing. Uh, individuals who are probably concerned about their own demand and yes. concerned about their image. Uh, how do you deal with those issues? The, the, the best way that we deal with it is um, really educating our players that you are in the driver's seat about how your IP is going to be used. Um, so, you know, for all of us, for lawyers, um, except, you know, thankfully, Eric. Um, um, Just play one on TV. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, for a lawyer, we're generally in a position, right, where it's either a defensive posture or it's something where we're being asked to enforce our rights. Um, the, the great role that I have is, okay, you, you generally have to serve in that role too, but having an asset where frankly, we're, we're America's sport, um, it is something that people want to be a part of. It puts both a lawyer you know, in one hand and a business person in the other to be in a seat of, wait a minute, we can actually dictate what we want to do. So you actually have the greatest amount of control over how you your brand or you know your technology or your ip is going to be used and for us um we find that to be incredibly advantageous um it, a player no longer has to kind of sit back and wait to see what deal comes along and that was the that was the passive way that we used to approach you know these deals someone would generally just being honest someone would probably call the nfl first and say, we want to use players to sell soap, shoes, whatever. Um, and oddly, because the NFL knew that we had the rights and they didn't, the NFL would pick up the phone and call us. Generally, they would say that you're going to get a much smaller part of the deal than, than we're getting. Now that's what on its head. So we actually get to go to a player now and say, well, wait a minute. You're actually in the driver's seat. We've got the ability now to go out and get those deals. If it's a deal you don't want to do, that's fine. But for the first time, you know, in the last, I would say, 10 years, we kind of changed the model. And when Eric was president, you know, again, um, having a person who understands the value of going into the market to seek deals, as opposed to being passive and sitting back to see what's happening. When it came to apparel, trading cards, and video games, we made the decision while Eric was president that we were actually going to go into the market first and make a decision about whether we were going to do a certain deal and, and frankly, to set the terms of the deal. So, you know, for our guys, um, it's, you know, again, I always go back to that story about Marvin Miller, you know, a group of players who just literally have kind of that black and white face on the underside of a bottle cap. Um, that's now evolved to our players having live unscripted television shows. And, and for some guys, they may not want to do that, but you know how wonderful it is to actually be able to go into the market and you can decide um, exactly what brand you want to have. 
mm. and then to have the horsepower of um, a capital partner and, and OTP to say, you know what, we can actually we can actually decide that we want to invest in this with an idea of growing this over the next five years. And, and again, I would say as a union leader, that was something that we didn't have the luxury to do. We, we just did. Um, you know, you, you, you try to figure out how to make a capital investment from this side of the table, it's tough. Having a, a, a partnership with, with somebody where that is what they do, and let's go out and let's take over an entire industry like we did with trading cards, and, and, and we can talk about that later. But, you know, in the way that I look at the arc of what we do, what we did a few weeks ago with trading cards was probably the most transformational business deal in the history of sports in the last 30 or 40 years. I mean, it, it, we've done really interesting deals. I don't know of any body in the sports business who decided to take over an entire market. And for us, <laughs> right, it's very, not only very cool, um, but the fact that we can now dictate terms in a way where we were used to people dictating terms to us, um, that's a game changer. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll elaborate a little bit on the Fanatics. I'm sure everyone saw the Fanatics deal when they uh, captured the licenses of several leagues and, and of the players. But that, again, that harkens back to what do you say in a year, year and a half of work? And it really kind of set the tone at the NFLPA when we said, and I don't know how it is in other licensing businesses, but traditionally in sports licensing businesses, licensing was done like the weather, right? It comes and it goes. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll license something today, maybe we won't, and the phone will ring eventually because they'll need it, right? And in it changed, I think, really under these leadership where it was, you know, we're gonna be aggressive about this, right? We're gonna go out, we're gonna pitch, we're actually gonna actively pitch our IP to the right people. And we want to grow that. We want to grow that brand base. We want more licenses in the, in the market in certain items, and we want to be able to dictate. And one of the things I think, um, when when Fanatics came out, you know, they kind of moved or not moved away, but just added to their portfolio of rights in the trading card business. Is what we saw was these legacy businesses and and the old trading card companies that had really not listened and not looked at what the market was doing. In the and our our fees are the, the the value that we derive from a lot of these uh, from a lot of these licenses are really on the backs of them. Like they've got to go out and perform, right? right? And so they weren't being responsive to the secondary markets, right? So our IP is switching hands constantly, right? And yet there's no there's no secondary royalty. There's no third there's so tertiary I'm royalty, right? An actor, right, is going to get a residual if, if he or she is in is passed down and in, in their movie or TV shows passed down. These these athletes are, even though the technology is there, uh, they weren't capturing the price variability that's happening. You went into a Walmart last September, uh, they had a box of cards for $70, and you go on eBay, it's a thousand, right? Well, you're only getting the seven, you're only getting a royalty up to the $70, right? And so when you're not pricing things the right way, you're not keeping up with the market demand, you're not understanding the differences there. There's a lot of licensees that will just say, or licensors that will say, well, I guess we need to try to find some new licensees, and hopefully one of those comes around. Uh, I think the way we looked at it was, no, 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 we can actually go do it ourselves, or we can go partner with someone that has the same sort of vision that we have. So we did a lot of research. We worked together in, in, a, in a very collaborative way, and it just so happened that Fanatics ended up coming up across as the right partner for me. But again, you know, when we talk about, I'm not going to go too far into the details. You can imagine the leverage that we had when we actually came to the table, we actually bring the deal to the table, right? right? And, and we're able to capture the value, not just on the front, not just on the way, but also on the back end. It's very meaningful to our partners. And, and really, I think is again, one of those cornerstone deals, I think, for the NFLPA and one team together that will live on for, again, really tens of years because it will completely change the trading card market as everyone knows. Well, and, and being able to go in with every other union as a part. I mean, we spent a lot of time at lunch talking about the, 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 the fractured state of European rights. Um, you know, the, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, when we find the right partner to join with us, and then we can come to the table and say, it's not only football players, but it's baseball players, 
women's soccer players, MLS players, rugby players, you know, just the transactional ease alone, mm -hmm. you know, results in a value of scale that, that we've never seen before. And, 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 and most importantly, it's very cool. <laughs> it's just very cool. Well, come on. <laughs> you know, uh, as a circuit, yeah, you just want to need a little bit of swagger. So one quick question before I turn it over to the panel. Steve, you mentioned the fractured state of the European sports. Yep. Was there a time at which there was a debate as to who owned the rights? Is it was yeah. the team owners? Was it the players? Was it the Yeah, team? And, and, and Eric's lived in this world, and, and, and we made it a point as the NFLPA because we're sort of that leader in, in the licensing and marketing business for sports to um, not only um, try to increase the breadth of our business, but to educate other European unions, worldwide unions, on on how to become self-sufficient. And, and when you start that, oh, you go down that rabbit hole, you find out that, okay, the, the, do their individual unions own the rights? Well, no, the answer is kind of kind of no. Well, do the teams own all the rights? Well, the answer is, yeah, kind of, kind of no. Does the federation own the rights? Well, they own some. And then it's all made even more complicated because, at least in Europe, many of these athletes are signing contracts when they are incredibly young. Mm -hmm. And the disparity between the language and the contracts, I mean, for all of us who are lawyers, you know, that's just a nightmare for us. Um, the disparity in the language or the coverage of the contracts makes um, that effort to, to, to put them all under one house or to at least have a clearinghouse where someone knows with a certain amount of certainty that if I'm going to write a check to company A, company A has those rights. Mm -hmm. Because again, as lawyers, the last thing we would want is to do that deal only to find yourself being sued by company B, C, and D who says that you're infringing on their rights. So, you know, I, I think that, that the only thing that means, at least for European athletes, is many of those athletes obviously are incredibly well known. Um, but the athletes that we deal with are not just the European football players or soccer players. It's the women handball team. It's the cricket team. It's the water polo team. Yeah. It's it's all sorts of other sports that are incredibly popular in Europe, where the athletes are not realizing the benefit of their IP. And so, to us, that next sort of iteration of what we want to do is not so much that the NFLPA makes money, but we want to start doing something so that those athletes who are not <laughs> as well compensated as, as some of the FIFA athletes are actually realizing the full value of their potential IP. Mm. And to me, that's really exciting. Um, you go to South Africa, one of the most popular sports in, in, uh, in South Africa is women's handball. I mean, they're rock stars. They're barely making a salary doing, doing what they're doing for a living. They are incredibly popular. There's a number of companies that would want to partner with them to use their IP, their name, image, and likeness. No one knows who to write the check. And so for us, um, I, I think that next evolution for, for people like Eric and an OTP and whoever comes you know, after this job, you know, that, that I'm in it, that next sort of landscape or platform um, is about how do we grow this idea that these athletes have an intellectual property value and how can they realize it? Wow. Well, Jim, yes. you're in the business of uh, protecting the IP of huge power generation systems. Then figuring out how to monetize that IP. So what are some of your thoughts about the comparison with what me yeah. and Eric are doing as opposed to what you do on a day to day basis? I think what, what I've heard fundamentally is the creativity that having and understanding what your IP is allows you to do both primary rights as well as the derivatives that come from those primary rights. It's incredibly important because we don't know the life cycle in my world we think about things in terms of the life cycle right if i were to compare and contrast that i'm thinking in terms of the, the longevity of an athlete for instance it may be three years it may be five years it may be seven years whatever the case may be uh, but during that period which is the same life cycle longevity we have to think how could we create protect monetize and extract all the value 
that we have during that capture moment of time, right? And how do we do that in different markets? How do we do that in different ways? And how do we try to create additional streams of, you know, kind of what Eric was referring to, additional streams that will come out of this one player or for us, this one engine or this one power. But I think fundamentally, what I'm most impressed with is the level of creativity. Because it's, it's not always, when it comes to IP right, if I can take a step back for a second, it's not always an or situation. Either we're asserting or we're defending. There's often times when we're asserting in market A, we're defending in market B, and we're trying to create market C. Mm -hmm. But having the right partners, right, and having that sort of spirit where there is no limitations, let's just figure out how we really do this. It's fundamentally to what we do. So I'm part of a 100-year-old engine company, right? And I came from another 125-year-old company in uh, General Electric. And one of the things that we constantly have to be thinking about is disruption, right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned NFTs, right? We think about trading cards. Well, and I, I don't know, this is purely conjecture. Conjecture, sorry. Is an NFT going to be this trading card like thing down the road, right? When we think about payment systems, when we think about just different ways where image, brand, likeness, technology, how could that be used? Because I know one thing, if we don't think about using it, somebody else will. They're probably already thinking about it. That's where the infringement comes in, right? Yeah. I hope I answered your question. I'm a little yeah. bit about yeah. this topic. No, good stuff. Good stuff. So, Mateo, yeah, I might, you know, you're in the world of SEPs and, you know, all kinds of integrated stuff across technology platforms. You call it up to what's called technology devices. <laughs> <laughs> well, we talk to that. <laughs> I sort of feel that coming. I kind of feel that coming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very, very yeah. simple. Right? And I'm going to talk about, you know, Ericsson events a new widget. Exactly, exactly. We'll communicate with. <laughs> so, I know as I just pointed out, we, we develop technology and we deploy it. We are at the forefront of innovation that from all the G's, from the G's all the way to now we're working on, on 6G. Just to give you a sense, 50% of all mobile traffic, that's just one piece of equipment manufactured by Amazon. And every phone out there, and many of the cars and houses that are connected, use technology to develop better. So, we see it both ways, right? We're a licensee of patents that we're a license for patents. Um, and, and you know, your comment about the coldness of technology, when I was preparing for this this, uh, this panel, I, I thought back of, of one of the cartoons that I was watching when I was a kid, and maybe some of the audience are too young for this. Uh, do you remember Wacky Races? The cartoon by Hannah Barbera? Yes. So there was my favorite, uh, my favorite character there was a math professor. And if you remember his name, his name was Professor Patent. Ah, and so that cartoon was in an era where creativity and the creatives behind the creativity, the Hannah and Rivera, and the protection of that creativity was very well understood across society and it served for society very well. Now, back to your point of the fullness of technology, I think you know, what, what is cool about Professor Cartelli and what is very cool about what you do is the personal uh, relationship and the fact that the persona is a licensing entity. But one thing that is often missed in the debate is the fact that. A patent is not a mere piece of paper. A patent is a testament to the work of the many people that work and develop that technology. So behind the patent, there are the investors who create that technology, and it's what a lot of men and women of all backgrounds. And so I want to remind the audience about that connection because sometimes you get lost in, in our debate. There is that personal um, connection there, and we shouldn't forget about it. Another similarity that I that I know that while I was thinking about this is the following. Technology like persona are out there for anyone to take. They're not self-enforcing self right? And that's particularly true for technologies that are contributed to the standard where you know, the standard is public and anyone can take it and, and implement it, right? And the business of licensing is a funny business because from an economics point of view, the disposal of the good happens well before there is any payment for the use of the good. In fact, it happens well before the user of the goods has, has even agreed to pay that. I was listening to a panel, a panel yesterday about uh, 
automotive licensing, and uh, one of the panelists, uh, number two, uh, I'm paraphrasing, said something along the lines of, you know, how do you pay for license? You can just use the technology and you assume the risk that you might get sued. That's actually very true. Paraphrasing what Dave Capo some time ago said, technology is very expensive to develop and very cheap to copy. And I'm not an athlete, and I'm definitely not a professional athlete, but I tend to believe that that's true also in New York. It's very, very difficult uh, to become a professional athlete. It's very demanding, and it's not as difficult to actually rip the benefit from right. using that. Right. So right. I, I, I see those two, two commonalities, well, two words that seem pretty dark side of and the bright side of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and we also talked a little bit about, you know, one other major difference is, you know, when somebody steals D and Eric's ID, it's overt and it's very clear because it's an image and they want it to be seen by everyone. Right. In your business and in Dale's business, um, oftentimes the infringement takes place very covert. And it's done in a way very deliberate to, to make it go for me um, and, and to deny that it's even existing. Um, so what sort of challenges does that create in the SAP space? So I, I, would take, I would take a step back and actually make it more of a, an IP uh, issue. I think in the last few years or decades, we've seen an increase in what exactly is described. And, Call it hold down, you want to call it additional infringement, you want to call it willful infringement. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to you know the, the, the times of Hannah and Barbera when the value of productivity was really understood across society, I am concerned of an ecosystem that doesn't respect IP rights and a society that doesn't understand IP rights and in, in fact expects everything for free because that can have a serious effect on the integration of the ecosystem from competition to uh, lower quality to uh, potentially higher prices, etc. And in particular, I think that sometimes we're missing, you know, some of the challenges that we face all boil it down to what is the motive for some of these challenges. Ultimately, it is to uh, lower costs for those using, using technology or using him and using the IP in general, right? um, which I guess is, is fair, not, don't take me wrong. But if we only look at the cost and we forget about the investment that went into creating that then I'm not sure that we're looking at the long term. Right? We're only looking at the short term of the cost reduction and forget really how costly it is to get to where we are in terms of technology. I think we can all agree that, in, in, at least in, in my space, but in your space as well, we've made incredible progress and uh, benefit this society as a whole. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. I would take a little bit of a, uh, an additional view, right? So. When it comes to infringement, there's a few different aspects of it. If we want to be in a particular market that may be more or less known for cybersecurity, cybercrime, you know, hacking, and so on and so forth, and it's a big market, are we going to pull up our stake and say, no, we're not going to do business in market X because of your reputation? Short term, that sounds really good. Long term, that sounds good. The more sophisticated strategy is the, the products or services or images and likenesses that we put into that marketplace. Can we adjust a royalty up front that will sort of offset for the potential loss? If you don't get that potential loss, then it's, it's icing on the cake. And I'll give you a few examples. And this is purely hypothetical. You, you cannot Google this at all. Really, you can't. But let's just say. Right. Say about 10 or so years ago, there was a big market that wanted to get a certain type of baby on us, right? So when we think about say, jet engines and airplanes, right? You have the control systems that tell the engine what to do, but then you have the avionics that control the whole plane. Okay? Very high tech technology. So a particular market really wanted to do that. And let's just say in this hypothetical, it's a state-owned uh, company, right? But that's a big market. Now we have to think about, okay, it's not do we want to be there or not. It's if we do enter into this marketplace, evaluate the risk. 
another risk of not doing that could be jobs mm -hmm. of our folks, right? Okay. So hypothetically, instead of giving them, let's say, the current version, say Windows 10, right? Can we negotiate a huge upfront for like maybe, let's just say hypothetically, $950. And, and they don't get Windows 10, they get Windows 7. And why do we do this, right? We know and they know that there's a greater propensity for IP leakage to occur. We know that. But we also know that if we don't enter that market space, if we don't get a toehold in that market space, our competitor as well. And they may already have a toehold in the market space. So when it comes to infringement analyses in a perfect world, of course, you would, you would say, okay, we're going to put the mold as one to use the warm up analogy to have your mold and everything else go around. But that's just not how the business world works, not in my world. I've been doing this for 25 years. What you have to really do is think through, okay, how do we make sure we protect the, the intellectual assets and figure out different strategies based on the market to, again, protect monetize and also think about improvements and derivatives. I think what you may have been referencing the passive force of activity. These, these sort of yeah. you would call them derivatives and improvements. But you but the real work is how do you enter as a global player, enter into these market spaces, meet them where they're at, right? right. And as a capitalist way, well, this is just how they do things, right? Whether or not it changes or not, okay. But we got to begin there, right? And how do we have schemes in place such that the likelihood of infringement may be high? But if you got a huge upfront, uh, you could call it whatever kind of fee you want, right? Yeah, but then there's mutuality, there's right? Mutuality, yes. So that's that's some of the things that I would say. It, it's always making sure we take the IP aspect out of it, right? Because there's there's business strategy, there's product strategy, there's IP strategy in that order and how are we thinking about this from, from those perspectives with our stakeholders? You're raising a good point because one of the at least you know, passing difference that I saw when uh, thinking about this panel between what I do and what yep. you guys do is really the sheer number of assets that are licensed to yeah. them, right? I mean, we at Ericsson, we have more than 57,000 grant patents, uh, many of which are actually standard essential, so we really understand, right? And generally, you know, licenses are global in nature because licensees operate globally and we have coverage globally. And so royalty rates and valuation really it's a blended average of a lot of, a right. lot of considerations, right? Yeah. They don't only look at a specific market, but they're, 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 really, they're really global. Um, and the other thing I think is interesting what you're doing because it reminded me a lot of what, for example, Panel Pools are doing in the network space, so aggregating. Price and offering a yep. one-stop shop yes. for, uh, for potential licensees. Uh, in, our, in our technology field, some bad pools have worked uh, well, other bad pools have struggled. We see, especially lately, uh, in, you know, the uptake has been slower than what we were, uh, we were expecting. And so the convenience that a bad pool offers um, doesn't seem to offset the sort of reluctance on engaging with a, with a bad pool. Uh, for licenses, and at the same time, a patent pool still maintains the right of any owner uh, participating in patent license to license by that. So it's actually quite interesting as a as a similarity. Well, it, and and that gets at another thing that, that I think is a, an interesting distinction. I mean, the the idea of valuation and how do you value the intangible property is always a challenge. Uh, we do with it deal with it one way in the technology space. B, I know you have books have been written about <laughs> your negotiation successes with with the league, uh, but you've kind of taken a fundamentally different approach uh, in, in this area in terms of image licenses. Talk about that. A, a lot of it is born out of, um, you know, it, it, I, I, I have one giant step back. I love the fact that no matter how much we talk about this, it all comes down to first year property. <laughs> right. Bundle of sticks, right? <laughs> it, it really does, and so you know, to me, that's sort of the best place to, to kick off. You know, union negotiations uh, are, are things uh, much like um, 
they're much like joint ventures where you, you have two parties who at least in theory are interested in a joint deal that's better than the, 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 the parts themselves. Our approach to our approach to licensing is perhaps not that. Um, we've taken the view that an individual athlete, um, his name, image, and likeness is is not only a fungible quantity, but at least when it comes to this, this is something that is unique and distinct and 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 tied to what it means to be intrinsically human. So, you know, we kind of look at, at it this way. The, the games, we, we love the games. Um, and whether they're played on, on Sunday, Monday night, or Thursday night, we've always taken the view the league does a fantastic job with the game. But when it comes to the individual athlete, we want Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and every day after the Super Bowl ends until training camp begins. That's our opportunity to take what that that intrinsic humanity of a player, and we have the opportunity for for that player to be empowered to to make an earning or a living from that. And and so it's not so much that we are in competition with the league when it comes to those issues. That's not true. We are, um, and and we do. You know, probably the best example of us. Um, making a decision um, like like you talked about, okay, what areas are are where we might have a mutuality, right? We do a thing called a commercial deal. So we'll do a deal with the league, and we'll decide that there's certain categories that we are not going to compete with in exchange for an upfront royalty or an upfront fee. And and, and the commercial agreement between us and the league um, is a hotly contested. Uh, thing that that we negotiate every, you know, consistent with every collective bargaining agreement. But we care a lot more about the things that aren't contained in that sort of agreement of mutuality. And and it doesn't mean that we necessarily go into the business trying to pick a fight with the league. We just feel that there's some categories that we're happy not to compete with. There's also some that we just decide that we're going to do on our own. And and does it create some conflicts? <laughs> yes, but you know what? Going back to a common thing, it sometimes kind of looks kind of cool. And and so for us, you know, having a company like OTP or the, the great work that people do downstairs in Players Inc., um, being in a position where we can go out and, and compete in these areas. I mean, perfect example. Um, you know, here, you know, this city is a little bit different because you know it, it's it's like five major cities in the. Country, that's a major market, right? Um, but I know when I travel to Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or, or, or other cities that are smaller than Washington, New York, Chicago, um, there could be a real opportunity for the offensive linemen in Pittsburgh to do a separate deal that's not precluded um, by our commercial agreement. And so are we actively looking at using OTP to go into these markets? to cut deals for groups of players who may not be the quarterback, who may not be um, uh, the star player, but but to cut deals on behalf of smaller groups of players who I know have a value in the marketplace, mm. to me it's not only exciting and potentially profitable for those five or six athletes, but isn't that what it means to say, okay, I, I, I have a value because I'm wearing this Pittsburgh Steelers jersey, but the five of us have a unique value that people can identify something valuable from just the five of us being together. And so, you know, whether it's those five guys going to a local restaurant and wanting to do a restaurant deal, or those six, seven, eight, nine guys going to a car dealership and wanting to do that deal, I, it's not about the money for us um, when it comes to that. It's about whether or not a group of people can realize their intrinsic value given what we do on a national stage. And and then being in a position to do that for um, for another group of unions, I mean, OTP, you know, Eric can talk about it a little bit, but you guys recently did a hospitality deal with, uh, for WNBA players, I think it killed them. Right, and I mean, it, it's, a, it's a classic thing that NFL players, and by the way, I do love them. I love them all. Um, but, you know, NFL players probably don't have to worry about 
are we staying in five star grade accommodations on on the nights before a game? OTP was able to come into the business, do this deal on behalf of the WNBA players that I know for them is transforming. And to me, that's the wonderful place where a group of, you know, at least for me, a dorky lawyer, right, can can find himself, you know, going into the stop, uh, can go into this market and um, and actually do some cool things that are actually fun. Okay, fine, fine, Eric. <laughs> but that's a, you know, for us, that's a very cool place to play. And again, juxtaposing that from a guy who decided, hey, maybe we'll put a couple of faces on some. Yeah, some soda caps. Yeah. <laughs> on the inside of the soda caps. Right! <laughs> right. And, and by the way, he had to do that because Major League Baseball had a deal with the, the bottling company on the front, couldn't do anything on the front. The guy reached in and looked at their contract and realized, hey, I, I know one space that they haven't they haven't covered with the contract is on the inside of the bottle cap. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, that's creative. It's creative. It's creative license. Creative, creative right 100%. And, and disruptive, which yes, yes. for all of us, you know, and it gave birth to a whole new a hundred percent, basically a hundred percent. Where where up until that point, no one would have thought of how do we become creative on behalf of the people we represent. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of uh, new markets, new entrants, if you will, uh, Eric, uh, what are OTP's thoughts with regard to the NCAA? Yeah. Likelihood that those are going to be now available. Yeah, uh, I've been spending a lot of time there along with colleagues and myself. And I think our big overarching idea there is just we really want to do for professional athletes. We want to do for college athletes what we already do for professional athletes. Right? And I think that there's going to be a lot of this sorting itself out. The market, I think, needs to just sort itself out. And I think that will happen naturally, probably over um, at least the next several years. But I think for us, we stay focused on what we do well, right? And we do group licensing, right? And I think there's going to be some other things that we'll do in that space as well. But when we think about what we do well, we do video games really well. We do trading cards really well. We do apparel really well. And so I think you know, we've already had a number of announcements. Um, we'll have a few more coming out uh, at some point here soon. And, and I think. Some of it, though, you know, what's interesting about the collegiate space is there is no aggregating anything. Right yes, there is no union, right? And yeah. so how do you aggregate 10,000? Right? Right. How do you ever aggregate five NFLs for just football? That's not even college basketball, women's, men's. That's not going into the volleyball side. That's not going into baseball, softball, and all of these um, uh, sports that have varying levels of popularity in, 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 in different locales. Right. And, right. And, and value. And value, value. right, in, in the popularities. And so you can go to Nebraska and sell probably out uh, personal or individualized volleyball, uh, uh, right? They love women's volleyball in Nebraska. They obviously, California is big, Penn State is big. Um, but it might not be as big in New Mexico, right? But that might be something else. And so how do you... You have to be, I think, very creative, and I think in the collegiate space we're going to, but I think it's also one step at a time. And I think there's a lot, you've seen a lot of trying to run before you walk right now, I think, in the space, and everybody's sprinting. And I do think it's, it's a market that's just going to have to sort itself over time. But again, to, to your question, I'm really trying to understand, okay, how are we going to aggregate these rights? And two, really staying laser focused on what we do well and how we do it, and how can, and how, are we going to really have to operationalize everything to bring this really with a, uh, with a market that has a lack of infrastructure? Well, and also what you've done, you know, building, for lack of a better word, sort of a brick and mortar building blocks of how we're going to do it. I mean, talk about open doors for for example. Right. So, so yeah, a number of our partnerships revolve around tech platforms, right? I mean, you start thinking about, okay, how do you, how do you aggregate 10,000 players? Some of it is going to be on tech platforms, open doors influencers of the world that do different functions already in the collegiate space and they were doing it in the pro space some but these marketplaces these online marketplaces where you know an athlete can do uh, you know get a 500 dollars tweet or a hundred dollar tweet or you know uh, you know parents whatever some of those are transacted on these uh, uh, marketplaces these technological marketplaces 
Uh, some of it is partnering with uh, athlete hiring groups, right? And getting the word out to you there. Uh, some of it is partnering with a, an actually another licensing agency specialized in the college space, right? And, and, and doing some of that in our partnership with the brand art group. So there is a, you know, when, you, when you're trying to catch a lot of fish, you better have fish nets, right? And, and, and you better have a lot of them. And so that's really kind of the idea here is this two headed monster of, okay, and, and, it's, and it's somewhat chicken or egg, right? How do you get the licenses if you don't have the rights? And how do you get the rights if you don't have the licenses? Right. And so at one point, they all kind of you know, moved to be right. with each other. And so we've had to do, um, we had to be creative. And, and I'm proud to say we've already signed Panini trading cards uh, to a licensing deal, um, which one team was exclusive in that space with them and, and able to go aggregate. So that's part of it. But there's plenty of and, uh, bigger fish out there. And, and big fish, I should say, not bigger, but big fish out there that. We want to make sure that we capture and capture on the app. Please don't have it. And quickly, uh, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're just giving me a time check. <laughs> yeah, Brian. I know you were raising your hand. We're trying to do it under the camera. Oh, we're trying to do it under the camera. Low five. Low five. No, I was going to follow up quickly on something that, that Eric said on the on value of different markets, because yeah. we're experiencing something very similar with our technology going in a lot of different verticals now. Uh, you know, on the world that I mentioned at the beginning, which is one, but in the IoT in general. And I think that the value of a technology ultimately really depends on the vertical of the use case, because it depends on how much consumers value the technology. And that value can be very different across verticals. Sure. For example, if you price the technology at the same level for smart meters and for connected cars, the risk is that you're pricing it too high in the smart meter uh, vertical and basically a hinder adoption. Mm -hmm. You might be pricing it too low in the automotive space to promote further innovation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's something that can uh, guide your uh, your evaluation when you look at really the use case and what the consumer is getting from the technology, which is something that is certainly very new in some of for us. Uh, and I think uh, it's not an evaluation, and that's an excellent point. Valuation should not be static. Is especially when you're, when you're doing deals, because this, I can tell you so many times when, say, you, you go under, let's say, super NDA, and you start doing due diligence on a deal, around that time, there's a particular valuation, right? It's not uncommon at all, especially if the deal drags out, that the valuation has changed. Maybe the market has changed, maybe there's new technologies out there, maybe there's just, there's just different things. And I think often, um, what the, I don't want to say it truly, but what the amateurs will do. They'll be so fixated on one particular valuation. Mm -hmm. We have to think that that valuation is static. Right. It's based on those conditions at that moment in time. So having a model where it, it's almost like live or at least updated to reflect the realities, not just when you go, go under an uh, NDA, but when you're thinking about closing and, and really adjusting that way and essentially having the wiggle rules so, such that if it swings this way, you're good. If it swings that way, you're even better. Well, we're getting uh, near the top of the hour here, so I thought I'd give uh, 30 seconds to each of our panelists to uh, make some closing remarks or maybe observations about uh, something they picked up in today's conversation. So let's start with you. Oh, I want to go back to something I said at the beginning. Uh, let's not forget that the panel licensing based on patterns and patterns are based on human beings and very clever human beings. And that's oftentimes they vote their lives to create technology that we use every day, every day for granted. And that's not the case when you're investing in development of those things. Yeah, would piggyback on on yeah, I mean it, it, it's property and and that value is intrinsic and in our case um, utterly human. Um, and, and so, you know, I know that sometimes everybody, every now and then, people will take a look at a position that the union's taken on something um, like that. Um, we, we start off with the athlete, and, and I'm proud to say that over the last uh, 30, 35 years of this business, including the things that we're doing now, uh, we start off with the person of the end. Yeah, I would just piggyback on both those great comments and just to say holistically, intellectual property is something that it's best done proactively, it's best done creatively, and it's best, best done with all the stakeholders in mind. 
otherwise it could be. <laughs> yeah, I, other than you know, listed in sports, and I'm also seeing starting to see it in other walks of life. I think licensing and really the core rights around licensing now, you're starting to see a lot of activity around how do you commercialize those rights, thinking about them in a much different way, and thinking about them holistically and building businesses, really important to businesses around rights that not all of it might be uh, uh, relevant to the specific right, but the, the derivative, as you mentioned, is part of that. And I, and I think you're seeing it now in so many, I know you're seeing it in sports a lot, but I'm starting to see it even in, in other walks of life. And I think it's really interesting. I think it's, I think it's great really for the licensing industry to kind of get this new breath of, of fresh air. And I think it'd be, be good for everybody to start thinking about it. That I think in a much broader lens and not just in the very uh, yeah. Well, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, in the conversations you and I have had, you, yeah. know, you know, one of the yeah. things that I think is, is most impressive is, is that you two have been able to persuade very influential people that licensing is really, really important. Yeah. And it's something that most people, when they hear about licensing, their eyes glaze it. Uh, but when you've got influential uh, celebrities like uh, professional athletes talking about the importance of licensing. It's a good thing for all of us and it's good for society as a whole. So thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much, cool. Brian, could you throw me a pass now?